We are joined today in Moscow by David Armitage, Lloyd C. Blankfein Professor of History at Harvard University. Thank you for joining us today, Professor. It's a real pleasure to talk to you, Stefan. In 2014, you published a small book together with Joe Goldie, entitled The History Manifesto. In the book, you urged historians to reclaim their voice in the public sphere by putting contemporary challenges into long historical perspective. The book was widely read and debated by historians across the world. Three years on, what do you think the impact has been of the History Manifesto and the debates that it triggered? I think it has created a genuinely global conversation about the importance of history, not just within the academy, but also within the public sphere more generally as well. Uh, as your introduction hints, uh, it has been very widely debated, it has been much praised, but it's also been uh, strongly criticised as well. I think many colleagues, especially in the English-speaking world, were made to feel very uncomfortable by some of its uh, polemical recommendations. Uh, but it's been very heartening indeed to see the very positive responses of colleagues in parts of the world beyond um, what we might call the most privileged academic centres, particularly those in the English-speaking world, who have seen it not just as a call for uh, greater prominence for history in the public debate, nor even for a call for the greater problems of history in academic uh, environments as well, but in some cases have seen it as a defense of the humanities to core um, in society itself. Uh, so we've had responses from uh, various Latin American countries, from Spain, from Italy, from Asia. Uh, the message of the book itself has gone well beyond history, and I think that has been very inspiring, that whether uh, the readers like it don't like it, uh, they found it important to debate it, and that has put history at the centre of these very important discussions about the future of universities, the future of the humanities, and the future of uh, knowledge uh, in a world where now we're talking about fake news and manufactured facts. Uh, I think the History Manifesto in some ways has become more relevant uh, in our current environment, even than it was three years ago when the first appeared. So you think historians have taken a more active role in, in the public sphere? I think it, uh, it's observable, certainly in uh, the country I know best at the moment in the United States. For instance, the Washington Post has started a regular uh, series in its columns putting the current political crisis into historical context, asking historians, particularly American historians, historians of the US, uh, to place particular issues into historical context. I think the voices of historians more valued now than they were two or three years ago uh, in serious public political debate. And that seems to be observable in many other countries as well. Uh, and that confirms our sense that many of our recommendations or many of the arguments we made in the History Manifesto were, as it were, collecting the threads of debates that were already happening rather than encouraging historians to do something that they were not already engaged in. Uh, so I think the, uh, the direction of discussion in line with the History Manifesto, even though it's not necessarily been inspired directly by the book itself. You, you, you touched upon it some in the last in your answer, but in, in the view of the recent search in global and transnational history, um, what, if any, are the prospects for historians to contribute to an improved intercultural understanding and tolerance across the world, particularly against the background of much anxiety in recent years over the rise of intolerance and undemocratic values? Yes, I think that's that's a very important uh, role that historians can play. Uh, the fact that the discipline of history itself is uh, based upon uh, the idea of multiple causalities, uh, of a multi-perspectival view of the past that is centrally focused on uh, contingency uh, and accident. Uh, these are some of the features that distinguish historians from other human scientists. I think those particular focuses uh, among historians are uh, becoming ever more necessary for us to understand both the underlying multiple structural causes and reasons for our current discontents, as we might call them in a euphemistic way, uh, but also to uh, stress that no forms of belief, no structures of politics, no economic structures are uh, eternal. Uh, this too shall pass would be one of the mottos of historians, I think. Another motto for historians, I always quote, is it's all very complicated, which of course larger publics in particular our political masters do not necessarily want to hear, but I think it's a very important message that uh, uh, to bring many voices, uh, 
many different developments into conversation with each other and to insist that everything has a history and to understand uh, our present in light of the multiple histories that everything has uh, is a means of breaking down those forms of intolerance based upon overconfidence in the, uh, the correctness or one might even say the righteousness of one's own point of view or the particular institutions in which one sits. Uh, I think that perspective as well as uh, indeed a conference like the one we're at now which together scholars from all around the world to debate issues of common interest uh, that helps us to create uh, a common dialogue even if it's sometimes a debate it is nonetheless a dialogue and a conversation that is the best way to begin to overcome intolerance through mutual understanding of each other's questions and concerns and indeed the history that lies behind them. In your recent book on the intellectual history of civil wars, you notice that civil wars have largely replaced interstate warfare in terms of the number of people killed and the number of, of conflicts around the world after 1945. This is also the period during which the last European colonial empires broke up. To what extent do you think that colonialism and its long-term legacies can explain the prevalence of civil conflicts today? Oh, I think there's a very tight connection between those two facts, the end of colonial empires, the reorganization of authority, uh, sometimes but not always leading towards independence movements after 1945, uh, is uh, very closely correlated with the incidence of civil war. So one of the most robust correlations I think social scientists who study civil war have discovered is the proximity of civil wars that is, uh, contestations within a single political community about the, the locus of authority rising to the level of large-scale armed conflict, uh, that the incidence of civil wars correlates very closely to uh, uh, the timing of uh, decolonization and the breakup or breakout from uh, imperial structures. So sometimes it happens very quickly within a matter of months, uh, sometimes it can take some years, uh, but there does seem to be a cycle, and it's not just after 1945, we can actually stretch the chronology back uh, to the early 19th century, it's very similar patterns can be observed, for instance, in Spanish America, in the first great wave, multiple uh, acts of decolonization, a very close correlation between the extraction of sovereignty and the reorganization of authority in the form of colonial territories of the Spanish Empire in particular, but then successive civil wars. And one can also, I think, see uh, the history of the United States uh, in that perspective as well. The only peculiarity about the US is that the civil war takes such a long time to emerge after independence. Uh, it takes a period from the 1770s to the 1860s to emerge. The same pattern is there as in Spanish America and in many of the post-colonial societies uh, of the late 20th century as well. And I think that, that pattern has been very frequently, uh, especially if we think about these acts of what we sometimes call decolonization as acts of imperial revolution, as Jeremy Edelman has called them, uh, that they're not, uh, they're relatively rarely, even after 1945, teleologically directed towards independence in the form of territorial statehood, but often involve multiple political uh, possibilities, uh, federations for instance, around the reorganization of authority of that contingency, the instability it sets up, uh, the, uh, the fissile nature of many of these states, uh, particularly those organized around former colonial boundaries, uh, lead to uh, almost the inevitability of further conflict, further secession, further battle over uh, the boundaries uh, of the state and the locus of authority. So I think that's, that's a very observable pattern historians would do well to investigate in more detail, especially over the long debate of the last 200 years. It, it sounds a bit um, pessimistic and, and almost deterministic. Do you think that our research into colonialism and its legacies can make a difference for the resolution of civil conflicts and wars? I think to, uh, to help us to understand uh, why these patterns emerge, how they've emerged, and also some of the important resistances to them as well, the ways in which, for instance, now in the 21st century, the international community, so-called, is finding methods to um, conclude more successfully uh, internal conflicts or civil wars than was the case uh, through much of the 20th century, for instance. Uh, so again, it's been observed recently that although peace treaties between states 
have vanished almost to nothingness in the period since 1945. Uh, at least since 1989, about 40% of civil wars are concluded by peace treaties now. Um, and some of those have held um, very well. Some of them uh, seem to provide the possibility for um, creating uh, the likelihood of reconstruction and reconciliation within particular societies. Think of the Colombian peace process, for instance, or uh, the, the peace process in, uh, in Sri Lanka, for instance, uh, that we seem to be moving, not teleologically, not deterministically, but blunderingly, but with some hope, uh, towards a set of protocols and possibilities where we may see the decline of, of civil wars. Uh, and that becomes observable, I think, again, in a, an extended historical uh, perspective. But uh, uh, perhaps even just as far back as 1945, you can see uh, the trend is becoming more positive. I'm not um, uh, remotely endorsing the theses of someone like Stephen Pinker, for instance, that um, uh, the better angels of our nature have somehow managed to triumph over the darkest aspects of, you know, uh, of humanity's. humanity to other, other people, uh, but I think we are seeing some positive trends beginning to emerge uh, in the midst of these larger patterns now. Uh, finally, you're one of the editors of a forthcoming book series at Cambridge University Press called Oceanic Histories. That's also the title of a book due to be published later this year, which you edited together with Alison Bashford and Sulit Sivasundara. Why, in your opinion, is the maritime perspective important at this point in time? And in what ways can it contribute to the field of global and transnational history? We have uh, edited this volume, which will be the first volume in the series of Oceanic Histories, and we uh, founded the series uh, partly to uh, confront what we call the terror centrism of most history. Uh, that most historians, most of the time, write about activities on land, uh, which, from a purely geographical perspective, uh, seems to be a basic category. 70% of the Earth's surface is water, uh, mostly oceanic water, uh, the oceans and the seas. Uh, we think, uh, following uh, a host of scholars in uh, different fields, uh, Mediterranean history, Pacific history, Atlantic history, um, uh, the history of other oceans around the world, that it's time to pull all of those histories together under a single rubric uh, and to rethink world history not through the land but through the sea. Um, in order to recover not least many of the, the layers of connections and networks that bound people together uh, in the pre-modern period, that is the period before territorial statehood emerged as a universal framework for organizing political authority around the world, but also the ways in which those, those networks still underlie and in some senses uh, fly above or cross over uh, the territorial boundaries of the state system itself. So uh, we hope that um, this volume Coming and also the monographs and the series itself will lead to uh, a reimagining of world history through its oceans and seas uh, at a time of evident fluidity in world history. This seems like um, a good way to provide a, a foundation for reimagining uh, our human connections, but also, most important, very importantly as well, uh, to reimagine uh, the connections between human history and non human history, the history of the relations between humans and other animals, uh, but also the relationship between humans, other animals, and their physical environment as well. So one of the major threads within the series, we hope, will be uh, what some scholars are now calling history from below. That is not history from below in the social historical sense, but history from below the waves, uh, to reimagine the world from under the surface of the ocean, not simply on the, uh, the surface of the land, which is a truly superficial history. So we want to recover uh, the inner space of the oceans, which has been so far lost to historians, if not lost to history, uh, as another means of uh, reimagining uh, our world uh, through its waters rather than just through its land. Thank you very much for taking the time to meet us, Professor Armitage, and I look forward to seeing the titles in the new series on Oceanic Histories. It's my great pleasure again. Thank you so much for this excellent conversation. <laughs>